the things that really drive me going forward since I've been doing this almost 50 years now is number one, I don't know about anybody else, but music does something to me that nothing else does. It takes me away, it takes me wherever I want it to go. And I think it's great if you can do that for other people. Hello, and thank you for joining us at this very special PSB event today. We couldn't be more excited to be coming to you live from our headquarters here in Canada and hope that everyone is safe and well. My name is David Kane, and I'm the Vice President of Sales here at PSB. We're delighted that its founder and chief designer, the legendary Paul Barton, is still at the helm of product development for PSB. Paul's work to develop the finest loudspeakers over the past 50 years has been met with great acclaim and recognition. I believe that his success and achievements are directly related to three qualities that he has demonstrated throughout his life. Firstly, Paul is a musician. He was a violin virtuoso in his youth and has incredible feeling for the music and an exceptionally good ear for how it should sound. It was this passion for wanting the best quality reproduction that drove him to start and develop PSB as a company. Paul also has a scientific approach to his work that validates his ear. It is well known that he uses the research facilities at the NRC in Canada to measure and analyze the performance of speakers. He has also pioneered studies in psychoacoustics to understand how we hear to better inform his decisions on product development. The science, however, does not take away from Paul being a true artisan. Watching his father hand make a violin for him based on a Stradivarius, also instilled a level of craftsmanship and detail that still drives Paul today. He maintains his creative acoustic flair in designing loudspeakers, which is validated by the advancements in technology, the science, and of course, how it sounds. Now we have a great event ahead of us today with some really exciting news to share about a new flagship speaker from the PSB founder and legendary speaker designer, Paul Barton. Now over to Paul, to tell you about his latest masterpiece. Thank you, David. Um, but before I do that, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself and PSB history. When I was very young, my father, who was a musician and a singer, was very passionate about music and got me into playing the violin at a very young age, even practicing before bed every night, preparing for festivals. Also, when I was 11 years old, my father built me my first full-size violin in our home, and which I still have, and uh, I continue to play it. Music is the center of everything PSB does, so it's based on all the experience that I've had with music and music reproduction. After finishing high school in, in 1972, I started PSB with two high school buddies of mine in a small town just north of Kitchener-Waterloo called St. Jacob's, better known as the locals as Jakobstedel, a little Mennonite town. Um, we started building speakers in the factory in real wood walnuts. Um, and then in 1974, I was introduced to Dr. Floyd Toole at the National Research Council in Ottawa. And from there, my career really did take off. Floyd was very interested in pursuing and studying the subjective and objective measurements of loudspeakers and trying to correlate if there's any conclusions that you can come to in how a speaker will sound uh, in a listening experience. And these tests were done with double blind screen listening, a good scientific method for sorting out human psychology. And as a result, PSB and myself was fortunate enough to play a role and also learn from this experience that I uh, had in Ottawa uh, visiting the NRC to do product development and also participate in the research that Dr. Floyd was doing. The campus at NRC is composed of about 65 buildings. And in those buildings, it employs about 1,000 PhDs in all of the sciences. Um, the division that I've been associated with is the physics department, which is 
better known as microstructural sciences, and it includes a facility which is based around acoustics. And included with that is a very well-known and well-respected and a very good anechoic chamber for doing acoustic measurements and evaluations of loudspeakers. After uh, spending many years at the National Research Council and pursuing a better and better speaker, over those years, PSB has produced flagships, uh, starting with um, uh, the Summit Series, uh, going on to uh, Project B2. Then after the Project B2, there was the Stratus Series. Then after the Stratus Series, there was the Synchrony Series. After the Synchrony Series, there was the Imagine Series. And so today here we come to what we're introducing for the first time to the public is the Synchrony T600 and the Synchrony B600. It is similar to the Synchrony 1 in that it has three woofers, each in their own enclosure, a mid-range driver in its own enclosure, and a tweeter to top that off. The woofers are a transitional design, meaning all woofers produce low frequencies, but the bottom woofer rolls off before the middle woofer, which rolls off before the upper woofer, and only the upper woofer rolls off to the mid-range driver, which then rolls off to the tweeter. In the design, we have produced a very rigid enclosure with an aluminum clad front baffle isolated by 60 durometer rubber, specially designed rubber insulators to isolate the aluminum from the rest of the cabinet. On the back of the speaker, there are uh, insulated five-way banana plug binding posts which can be wired in bi-wire, bi-amp, tri-wire, tri-amp, and you could even do bi-wire and short the bottom woofer. And let me explain a little bit. By shorting the bottom woofer, you're only reducing some of the very lowest frequencies, which could complement the way in which you set this up in your room. On top of that, we have these uh, rubber inserts that go in the port tubes, and you, you, you can select how many port tubes you plug. You can nece not necessarily have to put the same number in one speaker as the other because rooms are not balanced in that way. And you'll find that you can significantly tune a loudspeaker's performance, benefiting from the fact that you have three separate enclosures in each speaker that can be independently tuned based on having the port open or the port closed. So I invite anyone who is really into it to experiment with those things. And it gives an acoustic way of tuning your speaker to match the room. Along with that, we have the uh, cone complements, which are now carbon fiber um, and dust caps that have uh, damping to end the size of the dust cap to um, complement any breakup modes that occur, of course, carbon fiber being one of the strongest materials, has a breakup mode very much higher than the frequency range that it's covering. So a well-behaved driver over the frequency range that we want it to, to have. Uh, this is the woofer. This is the woofer for the uh, uh, T600, which is a six and a half inch woofer, carbon fiber with a fiberglass dust cap. And this is the woofer, or the sorry, this is the mid-range for the T600, which has a different material as the dust cap, all complementing the breakup modes that the driver has and, and controlling them. Along with that, we're using a brand new uh, design of our uh, titanium dome tweeter that was used in the previous series, but we've improved and better controlled the breakup mode caused by the natural breakup mode of the diaphragm, its stiffness and its mass uh, uh, with a phase plug, that's that bridge across the diaphragm, that helps to control the damping of the breakup mode. And this is a, a step up from the previous versions of this design of the tweeter. And to, to add to that, uh, we've um, 
included a very famous isolator foot for both speakers. The, the bookshelf has uh, inserted feet, which are ISO acoustic designs. And this is the IO acoustic Gaia 1, which is the uh, feet that we put on the T600. Another thing I wanted to talk about that's come up or happened since, or has evolved since the beginning of this development or flagship is the crossover design. And the crossover design on this series was done with probably one of the most sophisticated optimization computer analysis programs available today. Uh, and I say that because with the synchrony uh, and the previous Imagine T3 um, was a very difficult exercise in creating an optimal crossover, although the results were extremely good. I can just say that the improvement here is the transition between the drivers and the exact crossover points of each of them is much more controlled and has, has been applied, the theory has been applied and the results were very, very close. So I'm very happy about that. The crossover networks are a real step up. I just want to mention a little bit about the finish. Uh, one thing that I'm really proud of in, in these day and age, you know, handcrafted things are far, few and far between. Uh, the cabinet and the veneers are applied by hand and hand selected to be centered on the baffles so that your left speaker and your right speaker will not be identical, but they will be sister brother. They will look very similar to each other. And I think that's a step up when, you, when it comes to matching pairs of speakers, um, you know, that are going to live in the same room. For the bookshelf speaker, we also have uh, a stand which is um, designed to be used with the I ISO feet that are on the bottom of the speaker. And th this stand is a very robust, strong, very heavy metal stand. The significance of the Synchrony series after all of these years designing loudspeakers is that it's really embodying everything that I've learned not just the mechanical designs, not just the acoustic designs, but also the psychoacoustic side of things. As time goes on and you learn more, and I'm always learning, um, we learn as a speaker gets better or as sound reproduction gets better, so does our acuteness to evaluating how good or how bad we're here, what we're hearing is. And so as our customers mature, and as the industry matures, so does the product, and it becomes more and more refined. For example, I don't always, or I didn't always pay a lot of attention to some of the detailing in the frequency response, in the distortion measurements, in the fit and finish, the cabinet construction, all of those things we raise the bar on. And this is the significant one because it embodies some of the things that I've been wanting to do for a very long time, but the technologies in terms of the cone materials, the magnetic structures, optimizing them, and ultimately voicing the loudspeaker for listeners, to have listeners prefer it over other loudspeakers. One of the challenges for any speaker designer in order to m mimic what was originally intended, which are natural sounds, amplified sounds, things that are performed with bandwidth and volume levels that we expect to hear in live concerts or live orches orchestral music. One of the things that is most difficult these days to achieve is not frequency response is not necessarily off-axis response, but it's the ability to play the wide dynamic range that loudspeakers have to do to mimic real world dynamics. And one of the challenges is to get the sensitivity of the loudspeaker up 
to get the bandwidth and the deepness of the bass wider and to get the distortion lower. And Synchrony has achieved all of those parameters. It's more sensitive than the T3. It goes down deeper than the T3. And it basically is, in all aspects, a step up. Every so often, as time goes on, you come up with something that you say, this is going to make a difference. But not until that. There's no reason to do something just for the sake of doing it. And Synchrony represents a whole orchestration of features, benefits, and materials, and acoustic tuning that I don't think we've achieved to this level before. Uh, if anyone knows the history of the approach that was developed in evaluating loudspeakers over the years with the National Research Council and Dr. Floyd's tool, Dr. Floyd Tool's work at the National Research Council um, really set the stage for how to evaluate doing double blind screen listening tests. But as I said earlier, as listeners, we become much more acute so that the sins I committed earlier in earlier models are not forgiven in the in this day and age with the you know wild competition and the new technologies that are available and the experience that we've achieved by listening to speakers correlating the listening with what measurements are like and really be confident that the lion's share of people the normal listening or hearing people and even people who are just everyday people would gravitate towards the voicing and the dynamics and the frequency response um, and the, the low distortion that our products now enjoy. The thing I'm most proud of with the Synchrony series is everything we've been able to do about it. I don't know if that makes any sense, but the fact that the fit and finish, the materials we've used, we don't use a lot of plastics and all that sort of stuff. We're using carbon fiber, aluminum, real wood veneers, uh, very heavily constructed cabinets, well braced. All of the features that make a speaker kind of a window to what you're experiencing doesn't add any color, doesn't add any shades of darkness or lightness to what was already there. So it's like a window through which you see the musical performance. Well, the Synchrony series that we have now is really our flagship presentation. Um, the, the previous Synchrony was um, at the time our flagship and as I said earlier we've walked through some of the history of PSB and I guess one of the proudest things I have about the current synchrony is really everything has been elevated not to mention the kinds of materials that we use uh, real wood materials uh, aluminum cast basket drivers uh, fi uh, carbon fiber cones um, titanium tweeters, um, optimized with the latest firmware and software that you can that you can use, and the fit and finish in the cabinet design, the rigidity of the cabinet, the fact that the panels are all hand laminated, hand finished, make it somewhat of a piece of furniture. At the same time, it's a sound reproducer. Well, over time, uh, one of the things that, that the Synchrony has really stepped up to is in today's day and age, with wide dynamic range, high bit rate, things like 192, 24-bit, high-powered amplifiers, wide dynamic range recordings, the bar got raised 
over the years to be able to handle that type of thing. For example, the tweeter on this speaker with one watt into it can produce 95 dB. So, I mean, that, that doesn't necessarily equate to how loud it will play, but the point is it's a very efficient design that really will hold down the dynamic range that the real world and recordings that we listen to today have in them. Whereas back in the earlier days, CD and even before, dynamic range was really a handicap. I mean, you don't have to talk to many recording studio engineers to see how often they use limiters when it, or at least they used to, they don't have to as much anymore because the dynamic range is so much greater. So any speaker designer who doesn't pay attention to the ability of the source material to produce wide dynamic range, wide bandwidth and low distortion will be challenged. When I finish a design, in the case of synchrony, when I finish the design, you know, I certainly want to just sit down and say, okay, did we make it to where we wanted to be? And all I can really say, based on my experience, and you know, the satisfaction of doing something that people like and enjoy, I mean, it's really fun for me to just before I fall asleep at night to think about how many people might be right now listening to music on a pair of PSBs. It's a great feeling. And so th that's, that's kind of the way I, I take it. And, and synchrony, just in a nutshell, when I first really sat down and evaluated it, I was here in the lab and uh, in our listening room next door, and... Uh, I came out of that just saying, boy, that speaker is just so exciting. And that's really all I can say. Thanks for that, Paul. What a truly special new loudspeaker series the Synchrony lineup is going to be. The introduction of Synchrony allows us to re-establish PSB as a premium loudspeaker brand, with it becoming our new flagship range. A few years ago, we refreshed the classic Alpha range as the entry to the PSB family, and you will see more developments in the coming months and years throughout the PSB brand. Every element of Synchrony development process has been stepped up to match its premium status from the acoustic expertise, testing, and quality control of our manufacturing, something easier said than done during COVID. Here to tell us more about Synchrony Series and what to expect in the lineup this year is our product manager, Joe DeJesus. Joe, over to you. The designation of Synchrony is something that um, PSB reserves for what it considers to be the flagship of its line, and it is the flagship of the family. And that's more than just being a premium loudspeaker. Um, yes, the cabinetry is absolutely beautiful. The level of fit and finish definitely talks about um, the kind of care that we put into the product. But uh, more than just the aesthetic principles and, and the materials that are used, uh, there's a benchmark which is established with Synchrony. And um, it's been quite a long time since something, a product that we've created, has had the name Synchrony on it. And there's a very good reason for that. The first Synchrony product was designed about 15 years ago. At that time, PSB was a well-recognized speaker brand that was known for a large amount of engineering prowess that, based on acoustic research that was done in Ottawa, over 35 years of it. By this point in time, the engineers at PSB knew exactly what they wanted from a pair of loudspeakers. Uh, they knew the criteria that had to be, uh, in essence, focused on. Uh, they knew means by which to achieve them. And they were feeling very comfortable that they had come up with what they considered to be their formula, their approach, their philosophy to design. And at that point, 
they decided to see exactly the kind of performance envelope that they could achieve. Synchrony was a uh, no compromise, no holds barred expression or execution of what they knew at that point in time. So it was the latest uh, research and development, um, the latest materials that, that were proven as far as being able to incorporate into the speaker, a cabinetry, everything on, on the speaker was scrutinized and, and it was done to a level that allowed them to sit back and say, yes, we got it exactly the way we wanted to. And that was something that was rare at that time. Well, what resulted was the Synchrony 1. And the Synchrony 1, the moment it came out, uh, showed that we were definitely on the right track. Um, it was recognized as, as being one of the very best loudspeakers in the world. In fact, uh, one very prestigious uh, magazine uh, called it Equipment of the Year. Uh, and, and that was a, a wonderful thing for us to, to hear. Uh, a lot of time and effort had gone into creating the product, and we'd learned a lot along the way. And it set the bar for us. We knew exactly the level of performance that we could expect if we managed to work our way towards the very best that we could achieve. And that bar was set very high. And it takes a long time to be able to sit back and look at what was accomplished. And that's why we hold the word synchrony very, very dear to our hearts. In order to get the name synchrony, you have to be able to push the bar up again. In essence, these new models, in order to be deemed synchrony, in order for it to be put out into the market as the flagship, have to, in essence, perform significantly better than its predecessors, in essence, pushing the envelope a little bit further. So beyond its, its premium looks and, and materials, is it able to perform at a level that can definitely separate itself out and, and push the envelope over the initial Synchrony 1 model. And I'm very glad to say that we were able to. hope that you'll have the opportunity to have a listen to them and um, I hope they bring you many many years of enjoyment. Thanks Joe, that all sounds incredible and we can't wait for you to be able to hear the new Synchrony speakers for yourselves. Now the fun doesn't stop here today, we invited special guests Ian White from eAcoustics and David Morrison, founder of ISOacoustics to join us for a special live Q&A session on the new Synchrony series with their friend, Paul Barton. The new Synchrony speakers for yourselves. Now the fun doesn't stop here today. We invited special guests. <clears throat> okay, Ian, we're live. And good afternoon to everyone joining us today on YouTube Live. I'm your host and moderator, Ian White, Acoustics.com Editor-in-Chief. On a personal note, it is a great honor for me as a native Torontonian to be your host and moderator today as someone who was a PSB customer long before I was an audio journalist. Um, I feel very honored to be interviewing Paul and Dave today. Now, the matter of the day, we are here today to celebrate the start of the 50th year of this iconic Canadian loudspeaker manufacturer, and to also formally introduce the brand new PSB Synchrony T600 and B600 loudspeakers. Joining us today, first from Pickering, Ontario, Canada, is PSB founder and chief designer, Paul Barton. Afternoon, Paul. Hello. And also joining us today from Markham, Ontario, so not too far apart, is Dave Morrison, president and founder of ISO Acoustics. Good afternoon, Dave. 
Hi, and it's a pleasure to be here. So, Paul, before we get into our viewers' questions, I just want to ask you one thing that I heard during the initial video. Is it true that you started PSB while you were finishing high school? Because that, because that to me seems unbelievable. Yeah, well, I, I started PSB as sort of a hobby when I was in high school, and I worked in a hi-fi store, and he let me sell my designs out of my dad's garage where he built my violin. And I sort of got a bit of a customer base, and I used to actually make kits for university students. All the wood would be cut up, and I'd put in the screws. All you needed was a soldering iron and a screwdriver, and you could build your own speaker in your dorm. And so that's kind of how I got into it. And then when I finished high school, uh, grade 13, because back in those days there were five five uh, year high school. And um, at the same time, well, I started PSB in the summer of 72, but at the end of the summer, uh, I was accepted at the University of Waterloo Engineering Department into a co-op program where you go to school for four months and then you go into a work term for four months and you alternate over your career so that you can establish some work experience as well. And it was unusual with the university because they didn't really have anything set up where a student could employ himself on his work terms. So we had to set up a special circumstance. In fact, it didn't completely get done because at the end of each of my terms, the university would send me a document asking for an analysis of my performance at the company. Of course, the letter would be sent to me and I would be able to fill it out for <laughs> myself. And my guidance counselor and I used to get a kick out of it because there was really no example or mechanism in place for a student to be self-employed and in a, in, in a, but I convinced them that I had started this company and I wanted to use that as my work term. Interesting to say the least. Now, our first question today is from Corey Huber, who asked something that's a little different. He wants to know how you, Paul, would define a Canadian sound that you have curated over your career with PSB speakers. What specific qualities or attributes in your speakers you know, have you kind of used to get there? Well, it all started, as I mentioned earlier, when I was first introduced to being able to work at the National Research Council under the direction of Dr. Floyd Toole. Um, at the, in those days, this was in 1974 when I first was introduced to Floyd, where he was uh, in, in uh, doing experiments with listeners initially to do reviews for a Canadian magazine called Audio Scene, and they would come up and listen uh, in a in a listening room that was set up by Floyd right across from his office, and. The anechoic chamber was up and running, so the magazine could do reviews and then bring them over to the listening room and do some listening evaluations. And that evolved into Floyd starting to look at the results and be, make judgments. And all of these tests, like I've said before, were done with double bind screen listening. And over the years, we started to realize that some speakers were preferred and some weren't. And then if you correlate that with measurements to a very, as, as time went on to a greater and greater degree, you could predict people's response to those responses. And in answer specifically to the question you asked, what characterizes the signature for PSB is based in that foundational work. And the results of that foundational work show that flat on axis and good directivity, meaning off axis, it's still behaving very well. Uh, in conjunction with how it interfaces in the room with the room's reflections, the room's shape, the position of the speaker in the room, the position of the listener in the room, and the total sound power which the speaker is generating. Of course, at low frequencies, it generates more energy than it does at higher frequencies because as frequencies get higher it becomes more directional that means that the total sound power actually doesn't 
a flat power response. If this is the low frequency down here, then the high frequencies are slightly rolled off and there is a shape to that. And those things are just evolved, have evolved over years in order to create that signature. And I follow that kind of approach on all speakers in order to try and keep that window, as I mentioned earlier, as clear as possible, but do it so that you can actually mix and match PSVs. They don't have, hopefully, in my opinion, don't have any sonic signature that's related directly to that model. Um, if you do a good speaker design, distortion might be higher, but the main thing you want to do is try and keep the timbre of the loudspeaker. As Floyd used to say, if you don't get the frequency response right, nothing else matters. Absolutely. No, no, no. Dave Morrison, I want to uh, switch to you for a second. How did ISO Acoustics, number one, get involved in this project for the Synchrony series? And also, I'm curious because on the B600 that I'm currently reviewing, um, I noticed that the isolation feed are very similar to the ones on the Zazen isolation platforms that I've used for a while. So right, right off, the, right off the bat, and I kind of, I could, I could see the impact. I could see isoacoustics involvement, but the Gaia 2 feet, the footers that are on the T600 look very, very complex and involved. And I'm wondering if you could explain how you and Paul came up with this. Yeah, the um, the feet that are underneath the B600 are really a scaled down version of what's in the what's in the Gaia. So everything we do is based on an empirical curve. It's based on weight, and so with the smaller mass, the smaller weight, the feet are, are smaller. They still have the upper and lower isolator. They're still the same three part construction. There's no one single path between the speaker and the supporting surface, and so what, they're just a, they're really just a matter of scale. They perform the same, they're directional the same. Um, it's really a matter of scale. And then, but now, now one thing I did hear in the video, it mentioned the Gaia, but my understanding though, the feet actually on the T600 are the Gaia 2. I just wanna make sure that technically oh, that's right. we're correct. They're actually the Gaia, actually yeah. the Gaia 2s, that's correct. I, I made a mistake when I said that. <laughs> it's, okay, <laughs> it's okay. Now, Paul, next question is actually for you, and it's one that you, you and I discussed the other day. And I know that when I did my review of the PSB Alpha series a couple of years ago, this also came up. Kanga Empire wants to know, what is the sonic benefit of inverting the position of the tweeter and the mid-range? Um, as he's pointing out, a lot of us have noticed that you have them essentially inverted on the speakers. Well, let me go back to where I first started doing that. And that was with one of the flagship models shown in the beginning of this session, which is called the Project B2. And uh, the picture we showed didn't show it with the grill off, but underneath that grill was an eight inch woofer just towards the top of the grill with a tweeter below it. And when I designed that loudspeaker, it was the first time that I was going to implement uh, crossover topology using a Linquist rally fourth order transfer function, which means that at the crossover frequency, the phase and amplitude are the same, and the amplitude of each of the drivers at the crossover frequency is down 6 dB. But when you use, uh, keep in mind that if, if it's a woofer, the cone, the, the acoustic center of the woofer at the crossover frequency that you're driving the woofer is right close to where the voice coil is, the dust cap. So if the woofer's uh, acoustic center is further back than the acoustic center of the tweeter, which is pr practically flush with the baffle, you can put a step in the baffle to cause that phase alignment, but that creates an edge and not a good idea. So if you flip the drivers and everything's in phase at the crossover frequency, with a Lindquist rally, the fourth order filter from the seated to the standing position is, is in phase. So I, I realized that if I inverted the driver, I could get where the ears are, people sit or they stand when they listen to music, it would always be the same. And you go out there and look at a lot of systems that aren't designed properly, you will find that when you stand up, the speaker sounds completely different because the phase 
has changed relative to the drivers at the crossover frequency. And that's the reason why I use that technique. And we use, we use that technique even in the new Alpha series uh, that has come out in the last little while. So it's right from our entry level right up to the top. We're using pretty sophisticated transfer functions to make this phenomena in favor of sitting down or standing up and having the speaker sound the same, the way it was intended. Um, Josh Wan has a question. He wants to know if the um, the two speakers right now in the synchrony line are voice matched. I think he means both in terms of the tonal balance, but also you know the overall pr presentation. Well, the big difference would be in the sensitivity between the two. Of course, the tower has more sensitivity, plays louder with the same amount of power. Um, and of course, the bandwidth, how deep the speaker can go is a function of the number of drivers and how loud it can play. But other than that, the timbre and the off-axis response and all the attributes that give it its sonic signature are very close to one another. Okay. Now, actually, let's stick with power for a second because I know this is something that uh, comes up with a lot of people when it comes to making loudspeaker sort of selections. And I know, and I definitely noticed this when I was doing my review of the B600s. Um, Jamie asks, Paul, which amplification did you use in sort of the development of both speakers? And are there specific types of amplifiers that you actually recommend? And before you answer, I'll j I would just say that from my experience with the B600s, one of the things that I noticed from like almost right away was that they definitely like more power than less. Right. So, yeah. Well, both the B600 and the T600 are, you know, four ohm uh, loudspeakers. And in particular, the T600 doesn't vary in impedance from its over 20 to 20 kilohertz more than about three or four ohms up and down, which is quite unusual for a speaker, particularly a three-way speaker, where you often see the impedance in the mid-range go way up and the impedance at the cabinet tuning above and below the port tuning is a big peak in the response. If you look at the impedance curve of a synchrony, um, it is basically a resistor, but it's a, it's a four ohm resistor. So the amplifier will be asked to draw, uh, the speaker will draw a lot of current, which means the amplifier should be as stable as possible at four ohms. But most good amplifiers today really are capable of that sort of thing. But I will mention, if you're not a heavy rocker and you want to listen to maybe even a tube amplifier, well, one, one of the pitfalls of using a tube amplifier is, well, it's not as efficient, so maybe you won't be able to have as much power. But if we put that aside and say, okay, well, I'm not going to put kind of demands on it, but I want to hear what a tube amplifier can offer, which has benefits in terms of its harmonic distortion structure, which uh, appeals to a lot of people. Because the speaker, both speakers for that matter, have fairly constant impedance, the artifacts that are cr created by the fact that the tube amplifiers typically have output transformers, which have a higher output impedance than say a solid state amplifier. And if you have a higher output impedance, one of the things I do when I design a loudspeaker is I assume that the source has zero output impedance. Uh, that is not the, the case. You've heard of things like damping factor. Well, that yeah. sort of is a measure of how low the output impedance of the amplifier is. Uh, with, the, with the synchrony, you can actually use it with a tube amp because the output impedance will interact with the impedance of the loudspeaker, but if the impedance of the loudspeaker is quite smooth, it won't will not interact with the output impedance of, say, an output transformer. That's kind of technical, but I'm sure some yeah. of the readers understand the kind of phenomena I'm talking about. Now, I'm going to switch to Dave Morrison for a second. Um, now. <laughs> Audiophiles are familiar with isoacoustics products. Um, I've used them for a number of years under bookshelf loudspeakers in my home and can quite easily hear the difference that, um, in terms of how they change the sound. But could you explain to people who don't know, number one, who isoacoustics is and, and why isolation sort of feet and platforms like the ones that you design sort of make sense 
with all loudspeakers, but also in this particular scenario with the synchrony series. Yeah. Okay, well, maybe I could start by saying that when Paul and I first started talking about integrating the isoacoustics, I shared with Paul the results of our work at the NRC. And you can see in the anechoic chamber, we're not colorizing anything. We, we stick very closely. Uh, the audio spectrum is exactly the same. We don't have that suck out, that bass suck out at the bottom because of our structure, our, the lateral uh, design of it. And so acoustically, it's, it's, very, it's very benign in that way. When we look at it in the, uh, with the laser vibrometer, we can actually see the energy going down and how it's mitigated from exciting the supporting surface. And any artifacts or any reflections that are conducted back up into the speaker are also mitigated, which means that we get rid of a lot of the smear and any artifacts that can, that can affect uh, the imaging. So really by sharing this with Paul, it really becomes over to him now that, uh, you know, using his ears and his ears, being able to get the what he can out of the box. And um, at least you know that the consumer now will have a consistent result, regardless of whether they're on a hardwood floor, a concrete floor or whatever. Yeah, I have to say that um, I definitely noticed with the B600, um, on both the stand that actually, for those who don't know, there is a specific stand that has been designed by PSB for the B600s. And um, I tried the speakers on both those stands and also my own 24 inch stands, and I could very audibly hear the difference with the feet. So there's, there's definitely something going on in terms of minimizing the vibration from the floor in my own room. And so I think a lot of people would hear that almost um, instantly when, when they're listening to the speakers. Paul, I want to actually switch back before to something. You, before you ask another question, yeah. I just want to comment on that. And that is, um, if you have a pair of speakers in a room, and most rooms and homes have a basement, so the floor is made of wood. And when you put a pair of speakers on that floor, when the speaker is excited, the sound comes to you through the air at the speed of sound in air. But the sound or the vibration of the speaker with that excitation couples, if it's got a spike, say, couples to the floor and travels through the floor at the speed of sound in a solid, which is faster. So if you're using spikes on a wooden floor, is it better to hear pre-resonance feeling from the speaker before you actually hear it? or do you want to hear everything at the same time? I just want to point that out because a lot of people don't understand that what you're feeling and hearing, and maybe some people say, yeah, I hear a difference. Well, yeah, you'll hear a difference or feel a difference or perceive a difference, but I'm just trying to explain probably what you're hearing is the difference between how fast sound travels in a solid versus how fast uh, or yeah, how fast a vibration travels in a solid than a vibration travels in air. Yeah. Something to think about. I have a question for you, actually, that's both personal interest and then a design question about both speakers. So loudspeaker designers tend to either prefer either sealed or porter designs. So number one, I want your sort of thought process on that. And also, I've noticed that on both speakers, both the B600 and the T600, um, you include plugs. Uh, which has become kind of common with a lot of speaker manufacturers, plugs that you can place in the ports. Is there a way to, I guess, tailor how you use those plugs depending on, I guess, the room layout? Because not everybody has like, you know, perfect, you know, horizontal room with four walls. Some people have rooms where you have a, you know, you, you have an entrance into another space. So could you actually, I guess, affect the sound of the T600s or B600s by using a plug in a different position? Yes, because uh, even though they're really low frequencies, um, the way they interact based on their source, and the ports are on the back of the loudspeaker, and they're in three different positions. So depending on how far it is away from the floor or the back wall relative or some other boundary relative to their position in the back of the speaker, and most of it's the difference at at from the where the port is to the floor but um you know and it's not a high order effect 
where you'll see the most benefit by plugging the ports is you are reducing the amount of energy at that the port tuning is at. And in the case of the T T uh, T six hundred, it's around it's just around twenty seven hertz, twenty six hertz. And um, if you plug one of those ports, where you will see a reduction if you've got too much of a standing wave based on where the speakers are in the room, based on where you are, and the standing wave structure of the room itself. You will find that the most effect would be with any one of the ports or even more would be the reduction of the frequency that those ports are tuned to. So you can, it's like a tone control at those low frequencies where you can turn it down one and a half dB or you can turn it down three dB or you can turn, add another port and plug and turn it down, you know, five dB. That's the kind of thing that, that people would take advantage of. Now, it doesn't work for all standing waves in all rooms, but I think you'll find that most people, if they play with it, will be able to dial it in better than it was when they start, unless everything's ideal. It's hard to make that happen without trying. So your answer in regard to power, in regard to both speakers, has created uh, a long list of questions that we don't have time for. But one of them that's sort of interesting to me comes from uh, Simply Angelic, who wants to know if you would recommend bi-amping or even tri-amping with the new speakers. And do the amps have to be, I guess, running in, I guess, the top end, have to be stable down to four ohms? Yes. Because the speaker on the T600, for example, which you could either tri-wire or bi-wire or tri-amp or bi-amp, um, um, like I said earlier, is, is a fairly constant impedance. So, But think about it this way. The amplifier that's driving the tweeter or even the mid-range will not have as much demand on it as the amplifier driving the woofers just by virtue of the way music is. Right. You know, you know, if we were listening to the amount of energy at low frequencies and mid frequencies and high frequencies to be the same, the high frequencies would be drilling holes in your head because that's not how music music is similar and, and nature is similar to the kind of spectrum you see with pink noise, equal energy per percentage bandwidth as opposed to the same energy at all frequencies. Um, Dave Morrison, I have a question for you that's kind of interesting. Art Musselman wants to know, can it be said that acoustic isolators are effective at isolating in both directions, speaker to floor or floor to speaker? Yeah, they, that's a very fundamental part of what we're addressing. It's We're not only dealing with the energy that's hitting the floor that may be exciting the floor, but we're also dealing with the energy that's coming back off of the floor very much like a pipe bolted to the wall and hit hit it with a hammer. The vibration goes down the pipe and it returns back again. So you've got energy that's being conducted back up into the speaker and in both directions we're, uh, we're mitigating that. In fact, any of those artifacts that come up in the two channels that are similar in both channels, we perceive them to be in the middle and it causes the sound stage to collapse. So that is uh, a very fundamental part of what we're uh, of what we're addressing with the isoacoustics products. Now, actually, Paul, I have a question for you. In terms of when you were designing both of these speakers, I know it was probably addressed in the video, but was there a point when you were sort of designing the speakers and you had them sort of in the chamber and you brought them back into your listening room at you know at Lenbrook in Pickering, that you listened to it and you kind of said to yourself. Well, this might be one of the finest things in 50 years that, that I've designed that like you sort of had that moment where you realize just how much you have how much you have advanced the art of speaker design in Canada. Well, uh, I commented earlier on my overall impression after a sit down session, doing all the tuning and getting to the point where I thought the data was supporting all the experience I've had in correlating subjective evaluations of listeners to the objective measurements. And that's a point where I really enjoy because, I mean, even, even when I'm in the anechoic chamber, uh, 
I can't wait to hear what we've just done. So I often rotate the speaker on the table in the chamber so that it's facing out the door and I'll actually get my first listen to the loudspeaker of sound when I'm standing in the anechoic chamber listening to it. Of course, it doesn't have any bass because there is no reflection or the bass in the anechoic chamber is much more damped. It's not a total anechoic chamber down to 20 hertz. The cutoff frequency of the anechoic chamber is rated at about 80 hertz. And, and, and because I put the speaker on the same table with the same microphone location, um, I do a correction to uh, predict what the response would be down to 20 hertz in that environment. But, um, you know, as far as the uh, first impressions are concerned, I think I mentioned earlier that the only comment I can make is, I mean, I've listened to a lot of speakers and, you know, they all sound quite good. They all are representative of what sounds fairly natural. But you can also take it to another level where it just has something like it's it's more exciting. And that's the, the best word. I used it earlier. The best word I can think of when it, for me when it comes to listening to music. I mean, music, like I said, does something to me that nothing else does. And when you listen to a good speaker, it even does more. <laughs> Now, actually, I, I have, I guess, a question for you, Paul, that one of the things that I've always found interesting um, is uh, about PSB is both a customer, because I was a customer long before I was a reviewer, and then now 23 years later, um, PSB has always been a brand that has offered, you know, performance, but also unbelievable value. I, I think, oh, I know, I'm sure you get asked this a lot, but, but I mean, other brands in both the, in the Canadian and the U.S. side, in terms of loudspeakers, you know, there are brands right now who will, you know, push out hundred thousand dollar speakers. You know, and clearly, you have both the technical expertise and the resources at Lenbrook and with the National Re Council in Ottawa to create, you know, a cost no object statement piece. And have you always just been committed to producing really great sounding high end speakers that actual people can afford? Because I think that's what's been the appeal of PSB for so long. Well, that's really the basis of our, and originally back in 1972, our company goal statement was to produce high quality loudspeakers based on value. And we've not deviated from that, even though we've moved up the scale when it comes to price point. And you're right, there are a lot of speakers out there that's hard to really understand the difference when the prices are in orders of 10 times for something that may, or even is perceived as performing similarly, but um, I always pride myself, and I think it's part of PSB's DNA and that don't really do anything that isn't good value, and I don't do things that aren't going to do something to the product, you know? Like, people throw a lot of things at products that aren't necessary, and sometimes they, they throw things at products that make it even worse. So, at the expense of maybe making a marketing statement or maybe some aesthetic that, you know, is kind of cool, but it's really, it's really minimizing or challenging the speaker's capabilities in terms of performance. So value is a really high priority, and I'm proud to say that's something we've stuck to over almost 50 years. Years, yeah, and, and very successfully. I, I just have to say, I mean, as obviously as someone who's spent, you know, his own money growing up in his 20s on a pair of PSB Stratus Gold, a loudspeaker that I own for many years. I know that's sort of a speaker that when, when you search online um, on any of the audio forms, that, that's one of those speakers that a lot of people are like, oh, I wish I had never sold those. Yeah, <laughs> well, I, I still have a pair in my uh, in my family room. It's, it, it, it was it was a, just a great speaker. It, it was like in my mind growing up, one of the Canadian speakers that really sort of stood out. Like if someone was to say, what well, what was the great Canadian speaker from that period? I think the PSB Stratus Gold is the one that comes to mind first. Yeah, so. just so you know, that speaker was inspired by a request through the NRC to do subjective evaluations and set a spec for loudspeakers to be used nationally for by the CBC in Canada. And it became uh, an entry into that. And uh, I used to call it the switch. That was the original project name for it. And uh, we developed that to do to be used in the blind screen testing at NRC 
for the CBC to evaluate. And from that evolved the commercial version of that product. Yeah, I, I, I have to say that, I mean, for, I mean, um, my review of the B600 will be live next week, but one of the things that I can offer up to people who are watching right now, one of the things that really sort of amazed me in the two months that I've had a chance to listen to them is the fact that you have managed to pull so much bass response out of a stand mount loud, a stand mounted loudspeaker that I've been, there have been moments when I've been listening to, and I, I'm young enough that I listen to a lot of rock and metal still, and I was sort of uh, shocked by how much bass you were getting out of a six and a half inch driver, you know. And I'm wondering if you could just sort of, well, just quickly, because we're running out of time, just sort of touch on, especially with the B600, yeah, well, how you've how you've managed to do that. Well, with a small bookshelf speaker, one of the challenges is getting the sensitivity up to a point balanced off against the bandwidth or the low frequency capabilities of the system and. We've used some techniques in the driver design. Um, the magnet structure even has a, a little bit of a booster magnet, a neodymium magnet on the top of the pole piece, which helps to increase the BL of the speaker. And if you increase the BL of the speaker, it works good in a smaller volume. The higher the force in the magnet, the less box volume you need to get the bandwidth at a given sensitivity. And <clears throat> Keep in mind that when you do a base reflex design, and this system is tuned and fairly highly damped as a, as a transfer function at low frequencies, the energy that you're hearing that the, the, the uh, B600 has at those low frequencies is, domi is dominantly outputted from the port. So all of that low frequency energy you hear is, is the port. And the port is, is, is fairly linear. One of the challenges is to keep port noise to a minimum. But at the port tuning, where all this low frequency energy that you're hearing and experiencing is actually at the point where the woofer is hardly moving at all. The impedance of the woofer is low, but the force on the voice coil and the diaphragm, because of the pressures inside the box and it 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 utilizing the port tuning of the speaker means that the driver at those frequencies doesn't have to hardly excurt at all. So you get good, clean bass. Now, if you don't, if you tune it too high and you try and produce really low frequencies in it, then all you get is port noise because below the tuning of the system, the port is actually becoming out of phase with the woofer. So that's why a bass reflex rolls off faster below the tuning than, say, a sealed box does. But if there's no really useful... Um, if you tune it low enough and there's no real useful energy below that, then make it a high, uh, make it a, a second order or a base ref, a third order or a base reflex design and utilize the lower distortion that you get because you're making the port do all the work at the lowest frequencies. Um, we're down to our final minute here. So before I thank you both, uh, Dave Morrison from ISO Acoustics, thank you so much for uh, a your involvement in this presentation, but also the products that you manufacture. As a um, as a user of your isolation stands, I can attest to the quality of what you make. And Paul Barton, uh, a congratulations on 50 years. Let's let's get 50 more out of you. It, it, it would be a nice it would be a nice thing to happen. Um, I have no plans to change, but I do. No <laughs> you know, plans at all. The, and the Maple Leafs might win eventually. So, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll have to wait. <laughs> uh, before we sign off today, we actually today have three giveaways, uh, courtesy of PSB speakers and Len Brook. And, you know, for those who registered for the event, so I want to just announce them quickly before we sign off this afternoon. And I want to thank all of you on YouTube Live who have joined us today. Um, our first prize today, which is a $100 PSB Speakers gift certificate, um, the winner is Mr. Keith Lindsay. So congratulations, Keith. Um, the um, You can actually reach out to PSB. They will actually be in touch on how you can claim your prize. Um, our second winner today of a $250 PSB gift certificate, which is a really, really nice prize, goes to Robin Hilliker. So Robin, congratulations, and PSB will reach out to you. And then our grand prize this afternoon, which which I have to say is very generous of PSB because this, this is an unbelievable prize, 
Um, the winner of a pair of brand new PSB B600 Synchrony bookshelf speakers is Jeff LeBlanc. So congratulations, Jeff. You have an incredible pair of loudspeakers coming your way. Um, I'm sad to actually box these up and send them back to Toronto next week. That's about as much time as we have today. It's actually a little after five here on the East Coast, and um, we're wrapping it up. I want to thank everyone, number one, at Lenbrook in Pickering, who have done an incredible job getting this event organized. I want to thank everyone who has worked really hard behind the scenes putting this event together. There's so many technical things that can go wrong that did not today. So kudos, <laughs> to, kudos to the team um, in Pickering. And I want to thank everyone on YouTube for joining us this afternoon at four o'clock Eastern time, which is a little unusual, but we hope you learned something and we hope you actually now feel inspired to go listen to the PSB Synchrony series on your own. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone and good listening. Thank you. Welcome back. And what great questions and answers, Paul. Thanks for doing that. Oh, you're welcome. Here at PSB, we're hugely excited to introduce the new flagship Synchrony series today and to give you a peek at what to expect from this exceptional new line. We thank you for joining us and would like to remind you that Synchrony will be available to audition at our key US and Canadian partner stores and flagship dealers. Details can be found by visiting psbspeakers.com forward slash Synchrony. Again, Paul, it's always a pleasure to be with you and thanks for taking the time to walk us through the new lineup today. I enjoyed it and I really look forward to hearing people and their comments uh, on the new synchrony. Well, there's your challenge. Get out and listen to the speakers and let Paul know what you think. Again, we thank you for joining us today at this event and from everyone at PSB, we wish you a pleasant day and we hope that you all stay safe and well. Goodbye. Bye-bye.